Well, hello sugar buns. Welcome to a Hunter Persona guide based on Team Com. So, throughout this video, we'll be talking about the multiple different Team Coms that a survivor could bring out and what persona you will need in order to counter those. But of course, once again, this is going to be like it's like a Hunter Persona guide against different Team Com survivor Team Coms. We will be moving on towards a more in-depth Hunter Persona guide when it comes to hunters by themselves. But overall, for now, we're going to talk about what persona you should use against what type of team and how to identify the different type of team comps out there but of course once again hopefully everyone enjoys this we will see you in the video now the first team comp is what we will call the containment comp these are normal compositions that you will see without any harasser so you can kind of just run your normal personas here so then like if we think about it right any any type of survivor that doesn't have harass potential entomologist uh, entomologist perfumer psychologist prisoner the decoders overall and the containers overall who basically doesn't have any stone potential here Next one is going to be the decode comp. The decode comp, there needs to be at least two or more decoders in the survivor team comp here. Of course, for the survivors, it'll consist of lawyer, explorer, mechanic, prisoner, composer, and the mind's eye. There are currently six uh, decoders in the current game. But of course, if, it, if there are like two or more of these type of survivors, you are going to be needing control freak here and berserker. Now, berserker is a little bit more important than control freak because control freak is usually used for chip hunters mainly but berserker allows you to recover your attack animation 25 percent faster at max stats now why is this important this is kind of here to guarantee your double down situation against you know rescuers or even just to prevent the whole you know survivor whoever's on chair from rebound kiting which is why like you know the faster attack recovery you have the more chance the more chance that you can hit them again as soon as you can which is why for berserker here berserker is definitely very needed but of course you can also use control freak as well in which at max stats it'll basically allow you it'll basically increase chair elimination progress by nine percent it is pretty fast and also you know what each second in the game is you know survivors decoding time so like the faster you can get someone to come in to rescue the better it is honestly anti heal slash heal comp so in this composition it consists of at least one healer so for example doctor priestess and why is this important this is simply important because of the fact that you want to slow them down from healing so the persona needed here is going to be impact now if you also want you can stack this up with panic panic allows you to uh reduce the survivor's decoding time just just basically anting overall by three percent with a max stat of 12 percent because there's only four survivors so four by three is 12 percent now that is for key heal comp we also talked about anti-heal as well anti-heal uh consists mainly of perfumer why did i add perfumer in here it's simply because of the fact that if you have impact not only can you slow down perfumer's uh heal rate you can, perfumer also has an innate skill in, in which it basically slows down her heal rate as well so like with just those two stacked if a perfumer didn't use her perfume out properly then then in a nutshell you most likely will be able to stall a lot of survivors time from decoding which is why impact is pretty much needed now of course okay now for example barmaid barmaid uh so i did bring max impact here as we do see after we get a hit we see that max impact is here so healing time is increased by 25 percent from night watch but then like barmaid isn't actually a part of this because of tipsy tipsy will always be a 19 second time for uh, barmaid to heal up so it really doesn't matter right even if you bring max impact against a barmaid it doesn't work when barmaid's inner trait is tipsy so it, it takes 19 seconds regardless or not whether you have you know slow debuff or not when it comes to healing next will be single stone containment comps so single stone containment comps are survivor that has one slash two stuns only and you cannot spam these stuns so for example painter coordinator prisoner professor and the lucky guy with his own gun there as well with this type of team comp you only ne need to bring rage now you don't have to bring a full stack of rage just one stack is more than enough because you know they can't it's not like the stuns are going to be so long anyways now we're going to use cordy for an example throughout this we'll use cordy painter etc etc but first we'll come with cordy so i brought three stacks of rage here we're going to have cordy gummy to see how fast we recover from the stuns Oh, 
Well, now we can have Cordy gun me without rage. See the difference? Okay. Don't stop me, please. I need to move here. Now, next on the list will be a spammable, spammable containment comp. So these are these are basically survivors who can spam their stuns. For example, priestess, enchantress, forward, thief, female dancer etc etc now you are going to need desperate fight here a lot simply because of the fact that they can use their items within 15 seconds right since so their cooldown isn't that big so for example enchantress yes she can get stacks she imagine if enchantress has like two stacks you're gonna need desperate fight simply because of the fact that enchantress only has five second stuns therefore like having desperate fight allows you to recover 20 percent faster if you get stunned again within 15 seconds so imagine we're chasing priestess here and priestess runs through the portal and we're gonna follow up on priestess because like usually priestess means are really good so we're gonna be able to follow through the portal here but we're gonna be able to get a pallet stun here anyways we see that desperate fight is actually taken into effect we can definitely get stunned here once again so there's two stacks of desperate fight right there but even if we still chase after priestess here priestess may put that pallet down and then immediately use another portal to go somewhere else and since priestess has three portals anyways you are gonna get stunned no matter what so per each stun here, you are going to be able to get your desperate fight stacks here. So you will be able to recover really fast as you do see here as well. Now, next is the mid kite harass comps. So this is going to be uh, comps that consist of mid kite harass potential survivors. So in order to counter this, you're going to need addiction in which if there's more than one moving survivor near you you'll gain a 20 percent uh, recovery speed boost reco stun recovery boost now this tax this also allows you to bring desperate fight as well in which we just talked a while ago right but then like if you see the survivors here it's mainly consists of prospector enchantress teeth forward these type of you know mid kite harass potential survivors that in a nutshell stuns you for quite a bit and really annoys the heck out of you so like not even the, not only does addiction allow you with a 25% recovery boost, also desperate fight, the more you stack up to a max out of 60%, you're able to stack up to like 80% recovery after a stun. So then like if they really want to play it out like this, then you know you shouldn't be you shouldn't be too worried about the stuns overall if you bring this persona. So for example here, we do see that Enchantress is nearby. We're gonna go after this psychologist here and Ench is going to keep stunning me. Now, as you can see throughout this video as well, we do see that uh, Addiction has been activated, but also Desperate Fight is going up to a max out of three stacks here. Now, I allowed Enchantress to spam her spells. Enchantress in a nutshell has a fight and cooldown, but I just decided to turn off the um, cooldown there. Just to show you guys how little to no effect uh, does the Mikai Harass actually come into effect if you bring this persona. So for example here, Doctor is nearby, Forward is nearby, what persona do we need to counter this? Of course, we are going to need Addiction here, which decreases the effect of stun and slow when multiple survivors are nearby, which is why this is called a mid kite harass comp. Now, when Forward comes to stun me, there will be, I would say, around a 20% uh, at stun recovery speed. As you see here, we do, we actually do recover stun pretty fast compared to if there were actually no survivors nearby. So let's just get rid of Doctor here and then Forward's gonna stun me at, from the same distance once again. Now as you do see here, Desperate Fight has activated, but we're okay, lovely. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE Now next on the list will be the spammable pallet containment comp Now these are often survivors that spam pallets quite a lot For example painter Next one is female dancer, perfumer, doctor and journalist And low tier survivors in general according to quoted by Iris EMOTIONAL DAMAGE Okay so for example female dancer here Female dancer imagine I'm chasing the female dancer And female dancer pushes a slow music box down And then immediately after she's gonna put the palette down Just so I need to break the palette And then splurge the slow music box Now 
Uh, in this case, what is definitely needed is destructiveness since they're going to be spawning pilots quite a lot here, right? So destructiveness allows us to uh, break pilots 40% faster at max stats. So in this situation, we can break pilots faster and then we can break the music box immediately afterwards as well. But of course, since it's female dancer, it's a type of survivor that has three items and can keep spamming the pallets. So female dancer here, most likely after we break her next little music box, she's gonna deploy another one and then put the pallet down immediately while we chase after her. So we're gonna have to break it and then break the slow music box and then we need to go after female dancer here. So for example, perfumer, perfumer, why will perfumer be, uh, you know, a part of this category as well? That's simply because of the fact that a lot of hunter knows how to bait perfumer's perfume out and sometimes perfumer may use their perfume early as well. So then like if they use their perfume early, they'll use that five to six second time when perfume is still active to rotate towards the nearest pallet or window to vault over or to pull the pallet down but of course in this situation here we're gonna have the perfume and put the pallet down and with destructiveness we can break the pallet fast and then immediately follow up with another hitch before perfume gets our perfume back <laughs> So for example, journalist, uh, journalist will be able to spawn her little Orphe quite a lot. Therefore, we do need fast pallet breaking as well, since little Orphe does allow journalist to, uh, does allow the hunter to break pallets a little bit slower here. So then, like, if journalist is allowed to spam her items, that simply means that she's she's also a part of this category in which it's the, uh, oh my god, I'm gonna re-record a lot of this. <laughs> Now next will be the rebound containment comps, so these are survivors that can assist on rebound kiting, which is why nostalgic is definitely needed here. Nostalgic allows you to tease the survivors for 12 seconds right after they are rescued, but there has to be 4 survivors left on the field in order for this to activate. So this is kind of really good to prevent a huge rebound kite potential here from the survivor side. Now what survivors do what survivors uh, is in this type of category for example cheerleader antiquarian forward coordinator weeping clown aeroplanist and toy merchant now i won't be going through everyone but i think i'll be going through the big ones so in this example here we're gonna chair cheerleader cheerleader is gonna run up the stairs but imagine here we actually do chase after the anti current so we're gonna be able to get the hit on the anti current here and then anti uh, goes into rescue. Okay, my bad. Auntie goes into rescue. I'm using a second phone right here. So then we get the rescue here off immediately. I come back towards the cheerleader and then we're gonna start stunning her. So then, like, we can see here, uh, who's going up again? We can see, uh, the cheerleader going up and he, she's making such a huge distance. But at least we know where she is right now. Okay, so next example, uh, this is probably an even better example, but we're gonna use first officer example. Even though first officer doesn't allow rebound kite potential, but it is still pretty nice to be able to see which one is the real one instead of the instead of the actual first officer here. So we're gonna have first officer come into rescue. Right after we get rescue here, if we see Sia running upstairs, Sia is still highlighted. If you see here, right, even though there's two illusions right here, you can see Seer here is still being highlighted. Now, of course, this works the same with Magician, right after he ends invisibility mode, but I don't think I need to show you that anymore. I think this is more than enough. Now, next will be the Balloon Pickup Harass comp. So this is a team comp that consists of survivors with Balloon Rescue ability, for example, Forward, Batter, Cowboy, and Wildling. Now, why is this important? It's because these type of survivors mainly focuses on, you know, rescuing survivors from Balloon immediately, right? And uh, when you're picking, when the hunter is picking the survivor up from the ground, of course. Now, what persona counters this? It's Mischievous. Mischievous allows you to pick up the survivors 20% faster. Even with Wilding here trying to play mind games with me, you can, in a nutshell, try to push the survivor away from the area first before going back and picking up the survivor immediately so they don't have enough time to react. 
Now, next example will be forward. So forward here, forward has to be relatively close to towards this hunter in order to be for him to be able to get a proper balloon rescue here as well. As we do see here, we are going to be able to push forward away. But even if we do get managed manage to get the pickup right here, we could like you know drop down there immediately as you do see as well. Doctor having the drop down animation there was brilliant. It basically just shows us how you know important mischievous is. So we're going to be able to get the pickup here again, and even if four is about to come. You know, there's still there's still this dropping balloon animation, and you may say, "Hey, Kudo, this isn't good at all. This is actually very good." I'll show you here once again how you can immediately drop the survivor down. You have a lot of time to react here, especially with a 20% balloon pickup speed. There's nothing that the four can really do. They have to be they have to time this really well. But even if they time it well, they have to be like so close, because as you see, four there four was standing here trying to get the balloon rescue even there was a mini one second lag even, but then like you know it, it is still like really hard for the four to be able to get anything which is why i didn't put forward on s tier uh, well he's probably worth s tier but you know what i mean now the next example was batter batter is a little bit similar as well with mischievous but then like also at the same time you know batter does have a little bit more compared to forward here because even if you're able to push the batter away since you're able to get the pickup just a little bit faster a really good batter main has to be able to react just on time with that as well so then like you know usually in low tiers you would have a little bit of an upper hand when it compared when it when it's things like that but like in 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 high tier it really is just up to you yourself but mischievous definitely could work really well against batter as well Next team comp will be the balloon struggle comp. So this is a team comp consists of survivors who fully focuses on balloon struggling. For example, cowboy, gardener, and wildling. Now, in my personal opinion, you would want to bring max giant claw here. Three stacks of giant claw, no matter what happens, because it's going to be very important for you here. If the survivor struggles for you, it's going to be not good for you at all. It really is going to be not good for you at all. So then, like in this type of situation, bringing max giant claw would be for the best, as you see in the video as well so then like as we do see here we do get postman down we're gonna start brewing the postman to this chair there but then we do see as well that postman is gonna start struggling here but we also do see how there's a gardener nearby so then like what do we need to do? we need to fix this chair as well right so then in a nutshell what most survivors will do is to crawl away but uh, since this is bot there's nothing we can do about it and then like when they crawl away gardener will come in to destroy the chair once again and she'll have bubble as well and i usually during this time you kind of like oh no look we managed to struggle free well this is kind of why giant claw is kind of very 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 necessary against team comps like this so please do remember to bring giant claw now then, in this team comp, it's kind of called double rescuer team comp, but then, then again, you can, you can run this with, like, if there are two or more slow decoders in general, but, like, usually it's rescuers. So, for example, you could have journalist, forward, mercenary, coordinator, uh, first officer, gravekeeper. So those are our seven rescuers, but then you could say, okay, maybe cowboy, maybe batter, maybe another slow decoder like cheerleader. You could say something like that, but it's not really necessary against harassers like those. You can use other personas instead. But then like when running against uh, a rescuer team comp, you want to run constraint. Constraint allows you to lock a cypher machine that's the furthest away from you for 50 seconds. This works especially well with area selection mode, and I assume most of us are in area selection mode but even if you aren't in area selection mode in rank mode it still works pretty well like you know 80 to 90 percent of the time but of course we'll be moving on towards the video to show you how it works okay so we're gonna show you how constraint works here so i'll take a random map for example church and we we'll look at map information here so usually in church right you have nine sections so i'll just blocks uh draw out a section for you so the nine section kind of looks like this so you have someone spawning here someone spawning here 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 you know that yourself so what do we do in a situation in where there is two rescuers uh, in a nutshell, right, when there is two rescuers, as I said before, it's very slow decoding. So, for example, there is a merc, there is a first officer, a gardener, and a, let's say, maybe a lawyer here, right? So, in a nutshell, let's say, for example, a survivor spawns here, another survivor spawns here, another survivor spawns here, and another one spawns here. 
Now, when you play Hunter with constraints, so for example, let's just say you want to spawn maybe here. When you spawn here, it means that the furthest cipher away from you will be locked. So this cipher machine here will be locked. Now, this is not the best option for you because you don't want this cipher machine to be locked. You want one of the cipher machines in which uh, another, you know, decoder or a rescuer is to be locked. So in a nutshell, what do we do here, right? Uh, what we want to do is we want to spawn correctly so then we manage to lock off the cypher machine. So once again, someone spawns here, someone spawns here, someone spawns here, someone spawns here. So you want to tell yourself, okay, I want to lock either, I want to lock either this cypher machine, this cypher machine, this cypher machine, or this cypher machine, or even the one up here, however they spawn. So where do you actually spawn in this scenario? You want to spawn here right if you spawn here you can lock either this cypher machine here or this cypher machine up here but then like if you tell yourself okay kudo what if i only want to lock this cypher machine here then what you do is you want to spawn here this should be your hunter spawn points right so then like in this example in this example, you're chasing out for whoever's in shock, a rescuer's in the middle, a rescuer's in red carpet, and then whoever is here cannot decode their cipher machine. And then uh, whoever spawns in shock, you can't, you're basically chasing them so they are not decoding at all. So in this situation, you've one survivor who's going out to look for another cipher, and then there's two slow decoders here uh, trying to look for a cipher machine. We will take another example here, so let's go directly to, let's, you know what, let's just do Moonlit for an even better example so for a moonlit here we do we have a little bit more spawn location so i'll just show you guys here so we spread it in three quadrants but uh there are four quarters here so there's 12 spawn locations right usually if there's like let's say example here there's still two rescuers there's a merc and there's a gk and there's like maybe a gardener and a lawyer once again now, usually survivors spawn like this, they spawn by four stop, they spawn a bridge, they spawn here, and then they spawn here. Now, in this case scenario, you can probably guess yourself, Merc will spawn here, because it's the most dangerous area, and then maybe Gravekeeper will spawn here, because this is the second most dangerous area, and then you probably will have a Gardener here, and a Lawyer here right and then in your situation here you want to say okay i want to lock a lawyer cipher machine here so what do i do i spawn here because with constraint it locks the cipher machine furthest away from where you spawn and this is the furthest away as we can see two blocks away so two blocks wish and then two blocks height so you lock this cipher machine here now under the condition that you want to lock the cipher machine here instead so i'll just draw it out once again our quadrants under the condition that you tell yourself okay there's a mark here and let's say you you think that maybe it's a gk that's going to spawn here so there's a lawyer here and there's a first officer here right in this situation you say okay kudo what if i want to lock first officer cipher instead then you spawn here then you spawn here. Well, let's say that's 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 a gardener. Then then you spawn here. So as you can see, two blocks wish and then two blocks height away. This is the furthest away. So you manage to lock this cipher machine. Mercenary decodes here. Uh, gravekeeper is here and then lawyer is here. You can potentially here just chase after gravekeeper and let lawyer rotate to another cipher machine, which takes even more time. So yeah, that's kind of how constraint works in a nutshell. Uh, we'll just say this is the last one right so pushback slash slow comps so these are comps that uh, fills with survivor that allows you to push the hunter back and then slow the survivors as well so for the pushback for example we have widling forward batter prospector little girl and antiquarium and then for slow comp we have postman female dancer and acrobat but i don't really recommend you using uh this persona against acrobat but what persona is it that we want to use we want to use tolerance as you okay next example will be forward uh with tolerance for Forward needs to be able to push a hunter back in order for the hunter to get stunned here. But let's take this for example, right? Usually in this situation, when Forward pulls the ball from there, he can immediately push the hunter back towards that locker. But with Tolerance here, it, it will actually not land the stun. Please push me. As you do see here, that was just this much pushback. This much pushback for 25% ball. Now let's see with 50% ball. It's, it's not a lot, as you can see here, right? It's not really a lot, just, just this much. It's not... See, as you see there, can't push back as much. That 25% reduction is quite a bit. Now, forward's gonna stand next to the chair and try pushing me back. So we're this close towards the wall right now. Forward's gonna try push. 
and he still doesn't get it. See, see this, see this. That's, 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 that's definitely, like, from this distance here to all the way over there, this should be at least 25% ball. And we were so close towards the wall as well, but it still doesn't manage to push us back. So then, like, tolerance is definitely needed against forward and against batter. These two are very important. Oh my god, I'm gonna die. But haha. -ha. Okay, so we'll take batter for an example. So for batter, we brought instance here as well. So batter will try to hit me back while I chased after him. But as you do see here as well, when batter hits me, and when it pushes me back, it does push me back. But if batter wants to come back to get a ball, he will get hit here. This is mainly because of the fact of, you know, uh tolerance as well we can try this again but batter probably will use his bat and ball a little bit more earlier so for example here he will be batting but then like even if he actually wants to come back to get it it's either we pick it up and he picks it up and then we hit him or we destroy it immediately there so then like when chasing against batter yes it probably isn't the best choice of your life but if you do have tolerance it does make your life just a little bit better when it comes to you know batter coming back to get the ball Okay, next we'll take Little Girl for an example, just to show you a little bit more concrete proof for tolerance. So Little Girl is going to put down a page, and we're going to see how far the page actually pushes us back. So as we do see here, it pushes us back quite a lot. It went to around the... Uh, uh, this, I think this was around where, you know, the, 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 the sign was. We're going to have Little Girl push us back once again. Just to let you see, we're actually pushed a little bit further away from towards this border area here. Now we're going to bring Geisha with Tolerance. As you do see here, I have Insolence as well, since you see that bar is slowly but surely going up. We're going to have a little girl put down a page here and let's see how far we actually get pushed back. So as you do see here, we get pushed back right around the border of the sign. Before, when little girl pushed us back, it was quite a little bit further away from the border. But as you do see here, Tolerance does definitely work against little girl as well. Now, hopefully this helped you out a little bit more with the Hunter Persona Guide. I don't know what outro to do, so, uh, have a good one. This took me around, okay, two hours script writing. Actually, no, four hours script writing because I rewrote a lot to compress. A good, a good three hours recording, two hours editing, one hour rechecking. Ah, uh, well, you know how it goes. Subscribe, please. <laughs> That's all what I ask. Anyways. Goodbye. Hopefully everyone learned something new today. We'll try to get as much guides out as possible. But, you, but as you can see here, I'm trying to get the production rate up. Trying to make things more understandable. If you want to understand something new today, hopefully you enjoyed. Bye-bye. Poof.